Hi everyone, Chris Beeble here with Software Equity Group. I'm joined by Paul Lachance, an industry expert in the manufacturing and industri industrial technology space, who we recently partnered with to publish uh, a recent research piece on the state of manufacturing uh, in the US and the use of technology. Uh, we had a ple the pleasure of working with Paul and his team on a transaction uh, a few years ago, and we're just so pleased that Paul was uh, willing to provide his time and expertise to share some of his insights on what's occurring within the market, particularly given a lot of the challenges that have faced uh, manufacturers and supply chains over the past uh, year or so. We were able to work together and, and I think publish um, some really interesting content here on some trends that we're seeing in the market. And so we wanted to take a, a few minutes to provide some, some cliff notes on, um, on what you're, you're, you're likely to see within this report. Before we jump into uh, a bit of this overview, I'll let Paul provide a little bit of his background that's brought him to this point in his career. Awesome, thanks, Chris. And I'm a big fan of Software Equity Group. It's a real honor to work with you guys. Uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I come from a, a background where both my parents were entrepreneurs. So it's kind of been in my blood. I started my first company while I was still in school at uh, Bentley University. Um, built that company up, never had, a, never really had a, a normal job, built that company up and sold it, a uh, small deal, um, but gave me a lot of background and I learned a lot of lessons to create my second company by the name of Smartware Group. Uh, we had a, we have an industry uh, leading solution at CMMS, computerized maintenance manufacturing solution called Bigfoot CMMS. And, uh, you know, I, I cut my teeth in organically bootstrap companies, which really helped me learn key fundamentals and how to build a, a solid profitable company. Um, ultimately that company was acquired by Dude Solutions. That deal was underwritten by Warburg Pincus. Um, I, I recognized early in, in that second company in Smartware Group, uh, how, to, how important it was when you're building software solutions to have a solution that both understands what the market needs um, that core functionality, where is the industry going, but also the importance of having a really killer customer experience, UI, UX, the core functionality, the ability to dazzle in a sales process, and the real importance of having great services to create that stickiness, that retention. Kind of all those things together helped me build up that first company. We were, caught, we were acquired by Dude Solutions, a great organization that really helped me also understand how awesome it is to have a strategic investor or, or in, in the case of being underwritten by Warburg Pincus, you know, that private equity, uh, that fuel that they can put in to help grow a company to that next level, the importance of scale and those key SaaS metrics. Manufacturing was absolutely prime. Uh, and we were kind of in that right place at the right time. I had watched the trends that happened uh, several years before that in the CRM world. We all know the Salesforce story. And then a little bit later with the ERP world with NetSuite, manufacturing in the CMMS space and so forth was after that. But a great experience and in, 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 uh, to, to see how that whole process was done. I know one of the things that, um, you know, we'll talk about a little bit is, is just the opportunity um, to upgrade legacy systems with modern technology. And I know that was at least looking back at the work that we did with, you know, you and your colleagues and, um, you know, Smartware Group Bigfoot was that, you know, you all had, you were very forward looking, you know, in, um, you know, your sort of product roadmap and the technology and things of that nature in comparison with a lot of the other tools that existed in the marketplace. And obviously that's a lot of the, your sort of forward looking vision was, you um, you know, a lot of the, the reason why you all were successful with that, you know, venture and obviously is, um, I think, you know, something that is very helpful, you know, to, you know, to, to others uh, in the industry and to us when you can share kind of your, your market outlook and your, and your vision, um, you know, more broadly. So um, yeah, thank you, Paul, for, for taking the time to do so. Thank you. Yeah, and so maybe let's just jump into you know some of the questions um, you know that we have that um, you know um, you know you can sort of you know expect to to see within the report as well. Um, so maybe question one to you, Paul. Um, you know how have major uh, recent events uh, impacted uh, manufacturing in your views? 
You know, I think for me to answer that question, I, if it's all right with you, Chris, I'm gonna just throw a slide up on the screen. Sure. Um, to understand what's going on in manufacturing, it's just a little bit, it, we're in some crazy times in manufacturing coming through out of this pandemic, a real transformation that's going on in the space. Uh, this chart that I threw up on the screen here is um, is what is it's showing the what's called the PMI, the Purchasing Managers Index, and it's it's really refer it's really considered probably the the best barometer barometer of what is the health of manufacturing. And we've seen some crazy trends that have happened uh, over the past basically year and a half, two years here. So the PMI, which is this blue number on this chart right here, uh, anything greater than a fifty is considered expansion in manufacturing. Anything less than a 50 is considered contraction. This number comes out once a month. It always comes out around the first of the month. And what we saw, if you go back to the middle of 2019, um, although the economy, and I've overlaid the S&P 500 on there because they, they correlate to some extent, uh, what we saw in, in back then was, although the economy was doing great, this is pre-pandemic now, the economy was doing great, but manufacturing went into a recession in the latter half of 2019, and it did that because of the U.S.-China trade war. You know, think about that as much as we used to, but it was big news in manufacturing back then. And it was a global recession as far as manufacturing PMI index, that number is measured all around the world, and lasted all the way through the, till the end of 2019. We were just coming out of it. Things were starting to look better, and bam. COVID-19 soccer mm -hmm. punched us all. So we all know the story of COVID-19 It set equity markets down. It, we were all, uh, um, you know, everybody was stuck at home. We were shut down and so forth. Manufacturing took a nosedive at first. And uh, to my surprise, actually, and I study this stuff quite a bit, we came out of that by June of 2020, and we are still in the throes of a global pandemic the PMI index climbed out of, into expansion territory and it never has looked bad. It has really gone up. We're basically, we got to a 39 year high. So we're off that high now, but we are still at rocket ship high PMI numbers. Um, and, and it's amazing resiliency, which we've seen despite all of the challenges that have occurred. Uh, during this pandemic, how manufacturers have been able to just sort of keep up with these crazy demands, unable to get the goods and materials that they need. The supply chain, we all know how messed up that was. Uh, I actually have a, a slide right after this that'll show. When you look at um, supply chain interruptions, if you look at what causes those interruptions, every one of these little dots on here are different interruptions to the supply chain. And if you look over here, some are lower impact, some are higher impact, some are easy to anticipate, some are hard to anticipate. And you can see here the counterfeit, theft, common cyber attack. You know, there's a magnitude, there's a shock effect and you have some ability to anticipate. But as you start to get up in this shock effect, look where pandemic is. It is way up there. It is right up there with super volcano in terms of how it's gonna impact uh, manufacturing around the world. And we all know how hard it was. Sh borders were shuttered, transportation, distribution totally screwed up. Manufacturers couldn't get their raw materials to make their parts to get around the world. Despite all of that, we saw the, the PMI climb up. So really, despite a global pandemic uh, and despite really challenging conditions, U.S. manufacturing really did quite well. I think it's fascinating if you flip back over to that other slide there just to see, you know, obviously a lot of these 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 disruptions are things that folks can really wrap their heads around, um, but de don't necessarily have the context for how severe some of them are. Um, but just to see a pandemic potentially more impactful than a global military conflict, and obviously us just having gone through that, um, and then to see um, you know, sort of the um, the ability for some of these supply chains to recover um, has been just fascinating, and to see manufacturing recover um, in the way that it has um, certainly still a lot of challenges ahead. But it's just fascinating to see that this slide here with the context for you know pandemic versus something like global military conflict. Yeah, and, and you know Suez Canal blockage, and we were on the we were we just had gone over the U.S. China trade war tariffs causing challenges as well, and we're not over it yet. 
um, we still have challenges. Manufacturing is resilient in that it is making up for it. Technology today is really starting to make an impact to make improvements in supply chain management and, and really all of the SaaS uh, manufacturing categories. Technology will help, but this is an area where I really see it will begin to help more and more. So we can even be, well, we will be more responsive to handle these supply chain interruptions or whatever the next curveball that we get. Yep. So obviously, this is a major disruption that has just occurred. Uh, what is the current kind of state? Um, you know, what are some things that are occurring to help propel or support, um, you know, manufacturing, you know, particularly within, you know, the U.S. as an example? Um, and maybe some longer term, um, you know, headwinds, um, you know, or things that need to be addressed uh, in order to continue to support, you know, a robust industry. Yeah, you know, it's a really exciting time for U.S. manufacturing. Um, there's a couple of macro policy federal government initiatives. One's called Make in America. Uh, it's an executive order that was signed right after Biden was in office. It is a continuation of previous administration policies to promote U.S. manufacturing. I mean, the U.S. spends approximately $600 billion in federal spending, and they try, they require um, those goods and services to be purchased from U.S. manufacturers. So, and this is a bipartisan, everybody wants to, to make improvements here. Uh, manufacturing sector is 12% of the U.S. economy. The problem was... Uh, there was too many loopholes. Um, the, 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 the executive order tightens up those loopholes. It increases some oversight. It actually created a, a dedicated, quote unquote, made in America department within the Office of Management uh, and Budget. Um, it just makes it harder. U.S. manufacturers will have a, a fair shot to create products that if you want to have that made in, in USA, you, you, you're, it's gonna, you, you have to make those products here in the USA. And that I think is gonna really spur innovation and spur more onshore of these products, which will also help supply chain issue. It actually ties in nicely with a recent um, legislation that just passed the Innovation and Co Competition Act, which is a really interesting um, piece of legislation that it's to promote US innovation, a lot of it's centered around uh, semiconductor chips, EV, bat electric vehicle batteries, um, so to really promote innovation here in the US. We've, we've done such a poor job over the past probably 30, 40 years of promoting onshore development of these things. And this act is gonna put a lot of money into a research and development for within these manufacturers of sort of a public private partnership Real policy change. Ironically, China uh, has been doing that for a long time. They 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 put tenfold, maybe a hundredfold into their uh, into their contribution to the their economy to promote this. But you know, the combination of those will really will really help uh, build that. Um, the other big news, of course, is the infrastructure legislation. Now that has not passed, but I'm hopeful it will. I mean, we have not had a, a infrastructure. Uh, bolster in since the 1950s. And, and I'll even go back to, the, if you go back to the founding fathers, Alexander Hamilton, um, a lot of, you know, you all know him from the Disney and, and, and all that stuff he did there, but yeah. he, he wrote a report in 1791 called the Reports on Manufacturers, which really helped shape what's called the quote unquote American system, which really became a foundation for growth and, and success of our industrialized nation. He was an early champion of things like industrialization, proper infrastructure and maintenance. He talks about that right in the report. He's got this great quote. Uh, actually, I'll actually just read it because it's. It, I think it's very telling. Bet on manufacturing, technologies, infrastructure, commerce, corporations, finance and banks, and government support of innovation. Which, you know, when you, when you hear this, when you hear this, it sounds really familiar, but he really understood how you need to, you need to have proper infrastructure because our manufacturers, they need those back then. It was ports, canals, um, to bring in the materials and to be able to get the materials and the finished goods out because that was going to make us a stronger country. Sounds really familiar to what, we, what we're seeing today. And you know, the infrastructure legislation 
um, that is being promoted, I'm going to say with a real traditional infrastructure, roads, tunnels, bridges, ports, water supply, I'll add broadband and power, uh, alternative power supplies, uh, power grid to that as well. But, you know, we need to rebuild this in our country. Everybody, I think, agrees that our infrastructure is crumbling. Um, this is, this is going to be a major boon to U.S. manufacturers, especially with the Make in America bolstered by the Innovation and Competition Act, uh, that as much of the materials as we can will be made from U.S. manufacturers. So that's going to continue to bring manufacturing onshore. It's also going to create the need for manufacturers to keep their costs their efficiencies in control. They're going to have to rely on technology. SaaS software um, and industry 4.0 technologies will be the difference. Where we used to send you know, factories off to Bangladesh and, and other parts of the world because the labor was cheap and the environmental constraints were lower, we can do it now on our own soil with efficiencies especially gained through technology. That's why I'm so excited, not only about US manufacturing, but the industry 4.0, the SaaS software that it's going to take to really fuel all this. Yeah, that's some great points there, Paula, particularly as it relates to um, you know, policy changes in, in support of this of overall manufacturing in the US. Um, you started to touch a little bit there on some tailwinds related to adoption of technology. So maybe you could just maybe expand on that a little bit. Um, and then I'm also thinking about just with the current events and um, kind of labor shortages, you know, that we're seeing within the market today, um, just generally speaking across, you know, a myriad of industries. But this is also an industry that has had long concerns around labor shortages and an aging workforce, et cetera. So maybe talk a little bit about how, you know, technology can help assist in, in you know, that transition as well. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it isn't all great news in terms of um, there, there definitely are some headwinds that are coming. Uh, the aging workforce is a great example. Uh, we are an aging population. 50% uh, of all operations related people are set to retire in the next seven to nine years. We have manufacturing is a much more mature industry than other uh, workforces in our country because it's been around for a while. And the, the, you, you know, the culture was people stayed in those jobs for long periods of time. There is a tremendous amount of uh, brain drain that's going to start to occur. You combine that with what happened in the pandemic. Um, Deloitte has some forecasts that we're, we're going to have 2 million unfilled jobs in manufacturing over the next decade that we, 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 there's just not enough people to find to fill those jobs. And it is a combination of the aging workforce, but it's also the skills gap. Mm -hmm. um, because we stopped as a sort of a society emphasizing shop classes and, and those types of skills in our academic programs, we just don't have enough people coming into the workforce with those digital skills. And that digital transformation, which is going to really help today's factories, we just don't have enough people to do it. Yeah. So, and you, you see this every day, the help wanted signs that are all over the place. Now we're, we're racing to get those jobs, the, 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 those people back in these industries and some of the federal programs. And I'm a big fan of like the community college uh, programs that I'm seeing these days at you know, the local level is because there's great careers for people who didn't realize they were there. It's not gonna be enough. We're still gonna have shortages. So that's where we have to rely on technology. Um, and there's a variety of ways that technology can help us with that. In the aging workforce, for example, you got to capture that brain drain. A good uh, SAS, CMMS, computerized maintenance management system, you know, if, if you had that person who worked in that factory as a maintenance technician for 30 years, mm -hmm. they can change a bearing set on an asset blindfolded in a hurricane. Well, they're not going to be there much longer. They're going to retire. You need to capture their knowledge, capture videos of them, capture their step-by-step -step procedures. Combine that with using modern industry 4.0 technologies to say automate as much as you can of that process. So there's technology that's going to help that. But yes, all this infrastructure, all these US manufacturing that's doing great, we do have headwinds that will, will be an impediment. I am hopeful that combination of macro changes culturally about getting more people in that labor force, but especially helped with SaaS and industry 4.0 technologies, that will fill a lot of the gap 
uh, for, at least for those manufacturers who really embrace that. Great opportunity for technology companies to fill those roles. Great. Um, and Paul, so you know, we certainly see you as an industrial technology expert. Uh, and within that, you have a particular uh, history of focusing on the enterprise asset management and CMMS segments, which has certainly been an area that's been ripe for um, adoption of modern solutions. Can you just maybe talk a little bit about um, the history of that product category and how that's evolved to support uh, modern factory needs? Yeah, and what I think I'm going to do too, I've, I've got a, a slide I'll, I'll, I'll pull up on that. So yeah, manufacturing, first off, in the manufacturing world, there's a whole bunch of solutions that support operations. Um, there, isn't, there isn't just one, CMMS, Computerized Maintenance Management, which is often intertwined with EAM, Enterprise Asset Management, they're, they're, they're harder to differentiate today, is one of many, many, many genres of SaaS, or, or in, still in some cases, legacy on-prem stuff, but you, you all heard of ERP uh, type solutions, but manufacturing execution systems and a variety of others support that. CMMS, it's actually been around since the 1960s, uh, even in punch card days, some of really early uh, IBM mainframe, typically very large companies and government and military would do that. It's all about, CMMS is all about um, automating uh, maintenance operations. When you look at a, a factory, a lot of times you look at it um, from a technology stack, the ISA 95 model, so it, it starts at level zero and goes up to level four. Down the bottom here at level zero, this is really the innards of the production process. It's, you, don't, you can't even picture this because it's inside the assets that we think of running on the production lines. It's the sensors and the signals and all that raw data. And as you move up here, you get to level one, it's sensing, manipulated, it's the PLCs. And you keep going up, you start to cross from the physical world into the digital world. Um, so this is where you started monitoring and supervision. Once you get to level three, now we're in the software world. This is the software that sort of runs the plant, manufacturing operations management, or MES, manufacturing execution systems, is the common uh, SaaS software that happens there. Um, and as you keep going up, that's where the ERP is. But CMMS kind of falls in this level three, level four world. CMMS is there to automate preventive maintenance, corrective maintenance, keep track of your assets, keep track of your workforce that's doing all that maintenance. And um, they, they really have, they have a, a goal in mind. This pushing up the PF curve here. Now, I know this is a bit of an eye chart. I'll walk you through it. It's, it's, it's short and easy once I explain it. But what maintenance people are there to do is they're there to make sure that the assets running in those facilities are running at peak performance and they have as much uptime as they can possibly have. Downtime is a profit killer. And we try to avoid those that profit killer wherever possible. When I get an asset and I get it from the, the and it gets installed in my production line in my factory, that's as good as that asset's ever gonna run. So it's the assets in place, it's running, it's making its products. It'll all of a sudden, it's gonna hit this P point in the PF curve. That's the point where that asset stops functioning as well as it can. It's starting to degrade and it happens over time. That's a natural thing. They're running in sometimes harsh environments. You can't see it, you can't hear it or anything. It's subtle. Over time, that asset is gonna to continue to degrade until if it's not kept in check, it's gonna hit the F and the PF curve. That's the functional failure. That's the point in time where that asset is no longer able to do what it needs to do. If you don't take care of it at that point, it's gonna hit catastrophic failure. That's the downtime. That's the profit killer. That's what sends the, the, that production line to a screeching halt and everybody starts screaming in that factory. What CMMS does and the maintenance people that use CMMS, they are pushing up that curve. They are trying to catch those problems as early as they can. And SaaS software helps them do that. It helps them automate preventive maintenance techniques. In the old days, we'd go and check things once a month because we got a reminder 
to go check it once a month. In modern days, Industry 4.0, we can now use technology, the sensors, the condition-based monitoring, and getting that raw data directly from the assets into our CMMS and catch those problems up on the PF curve. That's what maintenance people are trying to do. That's what CMMS supports. And that's why modern SaaS technology aided with Industry 4.0 technologies it makes that whole process easier. And, and you can see now, as we move jobs and we move factories back to the US, we need to make those factories run efficient and lean. This technology really helps us do that. That's why the value proposition is really great on this. And it's a great opportunity if you are creating these technologies to, to make these, to catch, push up on that curve. I love the passion, Paul. It's awesome. Um, <laughs> So, uh, and maybe that's a good lead into kind of the final question here. So like, what excites you, you know, broadly about, you know, this space going forward next five to 10 years, et cetera? Yeah, there's, um, it's a really exciting time to be in manufacturing. I think one of the, one of the, one of the most exciting aspects of it is manufacturing is no longer this drab, boring space. I mean, I, I'll never forget, like, you know, you're at a cocktail party and you're talking to somebody you don't really know very well. And they'll see, you know, what do you do? You know, I, I create software for the manufacturing space and, you know, they glaze over and they're going to look for the bar right away. Um, manufacturing is not that anymore. It is a high tech, innovative and progressive space, especially as we move things back on shore. The democratization of the technology, um, that Industry 4.0, it's no longer do you have to be a, a big technology company to create these things. You can, you can start a SaaS-based company so much easier. You can harness and capture that data to use and create the predictive aspect of it so much easier. I actually have a, another slide I'll, I'll briefly put up here to show, um, to, to illustrate. There's these amazing industry 4.0 technologies that are that are here today. I, I, I call them the exponential technologies. Industry 4.0, and by the way, this is a Deloitte phrase that I, 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 I grabbed onto because I think it's awesome because it is exponentially helping manufacturers. Industry 4.0, we've all heard the phrase, and we think of Industry 4.0 just as sort of that internet of things, which it is one of the exponential technologies, but it's not everything. I mean, look at artificial intelligence and machine learning. That's, the, that's, the, that's what we need to do to create the true predictive and more appropriately prescriptive aspects to tell us exactly how and when to do our maintenance. But also things like 3D printing or what I prefer to call additive manufacturing, which is 3D printing to scale. You know, that's going to allow us as we get better with these technologies, we bring these factories over from overseas here, smaller factories creating the right amount of products for the markets where you need to sell them. You don't need to make a million pairs of sneakers in Bangladesh and then distribute them around the world. You can make these things more locally with these technologies. But, you know, you've got blockchain and the interface of things, the other IoT. So that's augmented reality, um, assisted reality, uh, virtual reality. That's the concept where these little goggles can have floating in the air. You know, which bolt do I turn? What are the instructions? Make those technicians accurately do the work and talk about in the aging, changing workforce to tools like this. So I'm a big fan of all these technologies that are coming into the manufacturers. That is creating a more exciting workplace. That is hopefully going to attract talent for those middle skilled and upper skilled positions where, you know, these people coming out of uh, these programs and these colleges that might want to work in a software company. It's pretty exciting stuff that is happening in these in these, these factories in today's day and age. And that's why, again, I'm super excited about what SaaS and, and these technologies can do. And from an, from an investment community standpoint, I mean, we're, we're just starting to get into this now. There is amazing opportunities, both as, as for the software company creators and the investors who are looking to harness and, and capture that value. Very exciting times ahead, Paul. I uh, just want to say thank you from all of us at Software Equity Group for taking your time and providing your expertise. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I'm sure you know the readers will. Uh, everyone else, we would certainly encourage you to pick up the research and feel free to reach out to 
anyone at Software Equity Group or reach out to Paul directly um, if you'd like to connect with him. Uh, thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Chris.